All right, everybody. It's four o'clock, but still going strong. I'm going to talk about I2B2. I am one of the directors of I2B2, and we have um, Mike Mendez is here as well. Sean Murphy is over there. Rita um, is in Boston, but couldn't make it to the conference. Um, so our our small core team has been working hard on I2B2, and uh, we have, in fact, just released a new release of I2B2 on Friday, version 1.8.1. And so can I have all the people in the room who worked on I2B2 1.8.1 in some capacity uh, stand up and let's give them a, a round of applause once they have stood. OK. <laughs> All right, any capacity, any capacity is fine. <laughs> all right, so, and this is, this is the growing acknowledgement slide of all of the people who have been involved in ITB2 over the years, and I think I'm, probably missing people, but hopefully this, the slide will continue to expand as, as I2B2 grows. Um, briefly, I2B2, um, I, I suspect many people in the room know what I2B2 is and use it regularly. Are there people in the room who don't know I2B2? Raise, raise your hands. Great, okay, I'm speaking to a friendly audience that knows all this already. So I2B2 has been, um, growing for 20 years and uh, is used at over 250 locations worldwide, uh, including large networks like the ENACT network that Sean and I talked about earlier. Um, it has uh, been, we've been releasing new versions uh, at a fairly regular pace. Um, the most recent two have happened if, between the last symposium and this symposium. So in December of last year, we released 1.8, and just on Friday, we released 1.8.1. And I'm gonna spend some time talking about all of the new features that those included. Um, this little logo that I'm showing on the left, I've been having fun with Dolly. I'm using GPT-4 for actual work, but it's fun to actually ask it to draw little logos for my PowerPoint presentations. And this one, I said, draw a logo for I2B2. I2B2 images use a lot of hexagons, so use a lot of hexagons. Also, the logo should capture themes, research, and patience, and that's what it came up with. Not too bad. Not too bad. So um, I2B2 1.8.1, and it introduces a new um, ENACT ontology, which is quickly becoming the most popular ontology for use in I2B2 in general, and so we've included it as an optional install in the core software release. Um, we have a brand new user interface was written by a great group of people who are some of whom are, are back there in the corner uh, in 1.8. So in December, that uh, new UI became available and it's been enhanced significantly in the new release. Um, we added support for the OMOP data model, which I'll talk about more in a couple of slides. Uh, we've we've added support for data export, which I'll also talk about in coming slides, and that's the beginning of a direction in I2B to support uh, small exports for deeper analysis on cohort data, and uh, the digital twin package, which um, Griffin and Sean and others have talked about a bit today. Um, there is a version of that available now with I2B2 1.8.1. So. Uh, briefly, the ENACT 4.1 ontology, um, it contains all of these trees. So these are the things on the left are the things that one might want to use. These are the kind of the basic elements one might expect in EHR data research. You have ICD diagnosis codes, you have uh, Rx norm medications, you have procedures in a variety of coding systems, uh, and then you have some kind of fun new things. There's an ACT research ontology, which I have a slide on. Uh, there's social determinants of health. There's a detailed vaccination ontology. And um, there's a details vital science and zip codes. 
So the new ontology updated uh, 11 uh, tables and added three new ones, the new ones being research, zip code, and vaccination. Uh, this is a screenshot of the vaccination ontology, which breaks things down into CPT4 and NDC codes for vaccines. Uh, social determinants of health um, includes, uh, oh, sorry, <laughs> this is the zip code ontology. The, the zip code ontology has these, these very nice breakdowns into hospital referral regions, rural urban continuum codes, uh, and the zip codes. So you can, uh, you can slice up uh, your zip codes in a variety of different ways. Um, there are new components in the research ontology that allow you to uh, f find information that's important, for example, in generating an NIH um, enrollment table, which is necessary if you're writing an NIH grant. And so some of the components of the research ontology directly support uh, building those tables. Uh, you can run new breakdowns based on the research ontology that let you look at uh, a breakdown of Charleston comorbidities in your patient cohort and um, most frequent diagnosis and most frequent medication ingredients, which is a, uh, a more intuitive way of viewing medications than the old medication breakdown. Um, there's also uh, data completeness uh, like patients with at least one lab, at least one diagnosis uh, are embedded directly into the ontology. So it, it adds a lot of uh, very, um, very cool new features to ITB2 and really shows off what the ontology system can, can do. The new modern user interface is not this. This was the original user interface that was available and is still available, but was the de facto standard until uh, last December. And it uh, was extremely functional. It had a lot of features and worked quite well, but it does look a little bit dated. This is the new user interface, which uh, has largely the same layout and design, but has some updates in the user interface and in the backend components. So it's using modern libraries and you can drag and drop more things, rearrange the windows in new ways, um, you can see some small changes, like uh, the panel in the upper right is, um, is now a vertical layout when you're developing queries, which is a little more intuitive than the old horizontal layout. Uh, you can see on the middle left panel that the uh, query info information has been brought to the, the forefront, and we are hoping to expand on what it can do in the next release, uh, so that gives you a nice new window into what's happening with your query. That was available in the last version, but now it uh, is, is vis visually visible at the beginning of your session. Um, there's new um, ontology search. There's a faster ontology search that parallels a feature that we used to have. Um, so, so, so ontology searches should go much faster. You can build temporal queries. Uh, you could build temporal queries for probably the last five years, but uh, this is the, the newest user interface for building temporal queries. Here you can say, see that I've, uh, I'm building a query for patients who are overweight and then also have uh, hypertension before their first ever mention of atenolol, which can be used for hypertension. So. Uh, it's a very simple, intuitive interface for uh, building temporal queries. Uh, exciting thing for me, and probably for I2B2 administrators and, and the people who run the sites, is that there's a new admin tool. We've had an I2B2 admin tool, but it, because of our limited resources, it wasn't being updated as regularly as all the other features in our client. And so the, the team has created a completely new admin tool that allows an administrator to do simple administration tasks of their ITB2 instance without going to the database and just doing things in the user interface. Uh, on the left, you can see there's a user management where you can edit and add users. Uh, on the right, you can see there's a project management where you can edit and add projects. Um, the left here is the user project screen where you then can associate your users to the projects you've created. And on the right 
is the actual project configuration where you can set your data sources and database connections for your project. So all of this is available as a plugin uh, that is part of the ITB2 client that an administrator has access to uh, if you have admin rights in, in your user account. Uh, we've added support for the OMOP data model. And the idea behind it is this, uh, I2B2 is an application or a set of applications that communicate via XML to a server process. That server process then takes those XML messages and translates them into uh, database queries uh, that then gather information from a database and create an XML response. Um, and the database by default is the I2B2 data model. But the um, logical contents of, the, of an OMOP data model are very similar to I2B2. So by creating a layer where the application server can talk to OMOP and convert these XML messages into OMOP queries, you can seamlessly run the I2B2 application on top of OMOP. Um, and thanks to work that Michelle Morris did and the ITB2 core team did, we've created these views that live in the database that make your OMOP tables look a little bit like I2B2 fact tables. And then through some features in the ontology that Lori Phillips developed a few years ago, uh, the fact tables uh, can be queried as if they were I2B2 tables seamlessly with the ontology thus allowing you to access your OMOP tables with I2B2 queries. So there's a version of the Enact ontology, which is in the I2B2 release, that has OMOP codes. You can see the hidden codes at the bottom are OMOP codes. The NS code is a non-standard code. It's an ICD-10 code. And the um, S code is a standard code. And that, in OMOP speak, is SNOMED, because that's the terminology that is preferred in OMOP for diagnoses. And those are automatically pulled into the query when you drag the folder over. We've tested this on large synthetic data sets and the performance is quite good. The largest development effort in 1.8.1 uh, was uh, data export, I think, maybe tied with user interface improvements. Um, the, uh, the important part about data export is that there are times as others have talked about earlier in the day, when you might want to do more detailed analysis on a particular cohort in I2B2 that you cannot do simply through the user interface because of the complexity involved. So you need some kind of data extract in a computable format. And um, there have been data export plugins in I2B2 for many years, but we're working on scalable data export that will support uh, things like the enclaves that uh, Sean was talking about in the Enact presentation. So uh, we have developed this tool where an LDS user can send a co cohort query to a data manager requesting a data export. That data export can be run and shared with the user, and this can power secure enclave computation. So the, visually, the workflow is like this. A, a user on the left there uh, can now choose a query type uh, with a breakdown. It's not actually a breakdown, but using the breakdown mechanism, they can choose a data request. So in this case, the user is choosing request demographics data and request medication data. So that triggers a process that sends an email to a data manager with information that the data manager would need to retrieve that query and perform the export. And the data manager can then log in, look at that query that they received the email about and run a data export. And in this case, running the same data exports that were requested. And it will export the data on that cohort using those queries. And this is all configurable by the system administrator it's running SQL queries uh, that can be that we provide. Um, we provide three different uh, SQL queries for OMOP, for Enact ontology, for Demo ontology. But of course, one can define whatever SQL queries one wants. 
for their own data exports. And it can generate all these CSV files that live in some place that the server has access to. And then it can be delivered back to the user through local institutional policies. Uh, it also can be shared with, uh, you know, sent to an S3 bucket or some other pl secure place where it can live in a secure enclave. And this is a slide that you saw earlier, so I won't spend a lot of time on it, but all to say that an investigator can request the data, it can live in a secure environment, uh, be pooled with other data for a study and then archive uh, once that study is completed enabling multi-site research. Uh, the other piece that we are, uh, that we've added is the digital twin package, which is a, a separate download, but part of the 1.8.1 release. And this includes loyalty cohorts and computational phenotypes. And um, I'm gonna say more about loyalty cohorts tomorrow, and you've heard a bit about computational phenotypes, so I'll go somewhat quickly. Um, loyalty cohorts, are a way of improving your cohort for research by using statistical methods to select a group of patients on whom you likely have complete data. Because patients have missing data for a wide variety of reasons, but one of those reasons is that patients get healthcare from multiple institutions. So if you get your specialty care at healthcare system A and your primary care from healthcare system B, then healthcare system B doing research on a cohort of patients might not know anything about the specialty care that the patient is receiving. So there's, there's some literature on this. There was a um, set of 20 proxy variables that had been shown to be very good at guessing whether a patient is getting the majority of their care from a healthcare institution. So we took that and we implemented a tool on I2B2 that can run automatically and can compute this loyalty cohort. Uh, and this is a visual example. You have your patients set, they are given a score based on the number of factors in their data. And then you can choose a score threshold using some validated methods that will allow you to have a cohort with a higher probability of complete data. These are the 20 high level factors that uh, are in the loyalty cohort. And the ones in bold face are all uh, routine care, things that, that usually are primary care things that you get if you're a certain age, at least, and a certain gender. But some set of these will occur in patients who are getting their primary care at an institution. And um, if you get your primary care at the institution, there ought to be at least something in the notes about other care that you're getting. This is the computational phenotyping portion, and this is Griffin's slide, and he showed this earlier, so I won't spend a lot of time on it, but all to say that uh, diagnosis codes, for example, are not great at uh, precision in terms of selecting a cohort that actually has that diagnosis specifically. So. Uh, using rule-based phenotypes as one solution, a more scalable solution is probabilistic phenotypes, such as phenorm, which is a uh, an algorithm that again Griffin talked about earlier that was developed by Nanshi Kai and her team. And these tools are being integrated into I2B2, and there are uh, modifications to the enact ontology that allow you to choose patients with uh, different phenotypes. So that is a very brief overview of what's going on in I2B2. Uh, these websites are uh, invaluable if you want to learn more. There's the upper left is the I2B2 wiki where we, uh, you know, it's a wiki so we can update it regularly so you can find a lot of information there that's, that's regularly updated. There's a Google group where people can ask questions, not necessarily about installing I2B2, though it is called install help. And then the I2B2 software page is a good one to bookmark to download the release. Um, and there is also a GitHub where all the code live and a JIRA where issues can be submitted. And we do welcome community contributions. Every I2B2 release since I've been involved has had community contributions from um, 
from different organizations. We've had uh, contributions from Pittsburgh and from University of Kentucky and, and Mayo and other places. So uh, definitely talk to us if you are interested in contributing to the next I2B2 release. These were also generated by Dolly and um, I put in some hoped for things that we might be working on in 1.8.2 and they came out fairly illegible in this diagram. So it'll be kind of the mystery slide of maybe, can you figure out what we were thinking about doing in ITP2 1.8.2? I think we, what do we have? Enhanced, imagined, matures, and uh, really management, and OLOC support, which will be very powerful in the next release. So, all right, I'll stop there and take some questions. Thanks. Do we have any questions for Jeff? Oh. Okay, you said it might click it on at the top there. Oh, it works, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, that's what I was hoping for bringing home. It's an I hoped for an identity management plugin for I2B2, like an LDAP or something. Uh, is it is it in or? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so you you you've interpreted this as having an LDAP plugin. Yeah. Um, the fact fact being that um, in most institutions, um, the the uh, you know the the uh, information security people expect that it's being connected in case somebody is phased out that it's being blocked right away. Yeah. So in the current I2B2, we have support. We've had support for some time for NTLM and Okta. And we added support a couple of releases ago for SAML. Uh, so does that satisfy the requirements you're asking for? Or, um, you have to ask. <laughs> yeah. OK. It's a, it's a practice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That, that, that might work, so. Yeah, yeah. That, that's, that's perfect because that's uh, what everybody was waiting for since since years. I, I, I remember. Okay. Yeah. Okay. We need to make the documentation more visible for that, I guess. But <laughs> that afterward. Yeah. For an additional question. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Jeff. Um, on the data uh, export workflow. Mm -hmm. um, beyond exporting the domain, do you think um, it might be useful to expand to drag concepts and export only the mm -hmm. relevant concepts mm -hmm. in the domain? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're you're reading reading our minds about the next release of I two B two. Yeah, so we want to. So there there is some work that has been happening internally, not in the core team, but in teams at MGB two. Uh, export specific data elements and um, summaries of data elements like highest hemoglobin or most recent uh, diagnoses and things like that. So so this is something we're thinking about for the next release, definitely. Thank you. We do have a question from a remote participant here. Uh, so this is a question for the loyalty set. Are all 20 required for each patient or only those that are performed on male patients or female patients, and depending on their age, were still applicable. Yeah, no, the um, <laughs> they're certainly not all required. They all are used to compute the score. So if you have more of these, you'll have a higher loyalty score. And uh, the the thresholds that we suggest are uh, such that both male and female patients are weighted equally. So it, it's it's not it's not favoring one or the other. I, I can't remember the exact mechanism through which that happens, but um, but we, we do account for that. So so no, you don't have to have all twenty. All right, we have one more question from a remote participant. How soon? This will be an easy one. How soon will one point eight point one be adopted by an act? Well, 
the uh, it's been released to Enact. Enact knows about it, and we are going to encourage Enact sites to adopt it as soon as possible. Um, we we don't have that much control over it because there are not a lot of sticks we can use, but we are encouraging that upgrade to happen in the next few months. No, there are not a lot of carrots even, that's true. Yeah, we don't have a lot of ways of influencing the sites, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, yeah, that is true. It, it is in the test network. So the goal is for sites to adopt it and roll it out uh, as soon as possible in the summer, if at all possible. Yeah, yeah. So I think in the upcoming upcoming weeks to months, mm -hmm. it'll be in there. Yep. All right. Any final questions for Jeff before we move on? No? All right. Well, thank you, Jeff, for showing us what's new in 1.8.1. Yeah. Let's see.